in the beginning you you think well, i don't want to generalize here but i thought i i knew how things work i knew how i want to do it um i need to know i, I know what i need to do to do it etc um looking back i knew nothing you can't really expect to knock on someone's door and tell them how great you are and how great it is what you're doing and expect them to say, oh, yeah, of course, let's team up. That yeah, We're going to do that. Welcome to Keep IT Healthy Podcast, a show hosted by people making things happen in technology, aiming to optimize healthcare delivery, health, well-being and fitness. My name is Jan Kaminski and I'm the co-founder of AppClover, a company dedicated to improving the quality of life with IT solutions and digital advisory. We started making this podcast to amplify great thinking to propel healthcare forward. Our guest today is Andre Ziegel, CEO at Enduco. Hi. Hi, Jan. Thanks for the invitation. What has brought you to this career path? What's your story in general? A very long time ago. <laughs> I was uh, actually I started with running, I think at the age of 14, 15, but only for myself. I was not a member of any club or anything. And then I decided to study sports science and started triathlon because why not? I think at the time Timo Bracht uh, was European champion for the first time or the long distance and the, the, the city he lived was not far away from where I lived at the time. So I said, I'll sign up for a triathlon. That worked pretty well. Um, and I think two years later, while studying then, I joined a club, um, became part of the, the team, and we competed in the in one of the leagues. Um, and we, we were actually quite successful. So we, we started in the third uh, division, I think it is called. And then next year was the second, and then it was the first. And um, Training got more and more intense, and um, my coach at the time he he sent me an Excel list every Sunday, um, which consisted of the training plan for the following week, and I did the training uh, without questioning anything. Uh, I just did it, and at the end of the the next week, Saturday evening, I sent it back to him and filled in what I did and what I didn't do and some comments. That was all the communication we had basically, and so. It happened what had to happen. I, I got an injury of a little bit too much training at the time. A training load was between 20 up to 25 hours sometimes, besides studying sports science. If I would have studied mechanical engineering or anything, that would probably not have worked, but as sports science, it worked. That injury basically forced me then to pause for over a year because um, a lot of doctors and physicians weren't able to find out what it was. In the meantime, I switched from the bachelor studies to the master studies. Um, and still couldn't really compete on the level I could compete before. Um, and I decided to found a company with a friend at the time who I got to know during the master studies. And we basically swapped sides. So we became coaches ourselves and started yeah, a small side business at the time to coach people. Um, then I figured, okay, to make a living out of coaching, I would have to charge the athletes a reasonably high price let's say 300 euros on average per month and only a few are willing to pay that so because you can only if you do it properly in my opinion you can only coach uh, a certain amount of people um, because it takes a lot of time and, and communication etc so and i thought there must be a way to make this kind of training more accessible to more people on a cheaper price than than those let's say 300 euros now actually in the Dach region it's it's 150 euros on average um in the us it's 500 euro, uh, dollars per month so um still relatively high prices yeah and that uh, overall led to the idea of using some sort of ai i'm a sports scientist i had no idea whatsoever about it at the mo at, at this time to use ai to make this kind of training more accessible to to everyone that's that's how it started by the way i I, my, my personal trainer still uses Excel, <laughs> so I think it's, it's ah, a real problem. Well, yeah. it, it, it depends. I mean, in endurance sports, there are now platforms most people use. I think the biggest one is Training Peaks, and that's what we used at the time uh, as well. But still, there is a there is a human involved in the process, no, 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 and yeah, that I, human needs to be paid. I meant the the, the like the gym trainer Excel. But oh wow. Triathlon, I I used Training Peaks just you know for yeah. that that was the one, but for the for the gym that was the the, 
but you know i, I want to i know you uh, you we will talk about your business in um uh, in a minute obviously we'll cover some topics related to that but what was the main inspiration to 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 to, to the creation of enduka was it like a real problem that you felt or was it rather something that you just didn't like in the traditional uh sporting environment probably a mix of it so my my view on the company as itself and yeah that that all has changed so in the beginning i think my initial idea was i don't like the way it's done now i want to change it and especially as a student you simply can't afford a coach that is 150 euros or what per month and there was no other solution like the one we created at the time i found out later we'll probably get to that that a lot of other startups not a lot of but a few startups started around the same time to work on similar ideas so somehow it apparently was this time where this kind of training um automated training became interesting to more people not just to me but my view on building a company was not oh this is a huge market opportunity let's let's go in this that shifted a little bit now i think it's a very huge marketing of uh, marketing market opportunity but um my view on that has certainly changed yes with that because you just mentioned this uh with the competitors uh i know there are a few fitness training uh, apps i know that yours is using ai also to to enhance the the experience of of um, of using the app so i have like two questions a what's the usp and says could you okay, like what what's the ai component i think that's one of the usps right and the second thing is how do you dif- differentiate from from the market like how i mean what's your marketing strategy in the sense like how do you do it because i know there are a lot of communication around sport uh, and apps for trainings especially okay that's that's two different let's start with competition so first i don't think everyone needs to ai just uh, needs to use ai just for the sake of using ai there are still i think a lot of solutions that actually work better without ai but in terms of marketing and fundraising etc ai of course, it sounds great so when we started there were a few or there still are around tracking apps i call them so adidas running now formerly runtastic nike training or nike running um and and a few others but a lot of them at a certain time became or were bought by bigger companies basically to become part of their marketing strategy um i think especially with adidas running i mean we could see that they don't really care about training but they use it to push their products to to users and basically have a a market research tool at hand and all they all those apps did was tracking what you did so they helped you to look in the past and what we did then was to use this data and basically look in the future and say okay if you want to get to point b you're now at point a what do you need to do in order to get there so based on what you did previously what's necessary for you to do in terms of training to get there and to get there healthy that is also one of the main differences because the other competitor at the time were standard training plans that you could download for free mostly from the internet my basic example is this excel sheet or pdf saying here's your half marathon plan in 6 months but everyone gets the same plan and um there were actually studies showing that people using this kind of um training have a higher rate or higher risk of getting injured and so for us from the beginning um we call it now fatigue level um this was the main metric we and the users um looked at so yes we get you to a certain point but we'll try to keep you in a healthy range because endurance training is is a long shot game you need to do it long um to be successful and in order to be able to do it long you need to stay healthy so that was uh, that was one of the main differences and then also the way our technology puts together the training sessions is i think unique of course i don't know other technologies but um the way we built it it's basically capable of doing millions of possible training sessions and it always picks the one that suits you the best at the given time so 
those two were when we started the main differentiators, I'd say. And then you asked about marketing. In the very early days, we, because AI needs data. So we needed data because we didn't have any. So what we decided is we had actually ideas for a bunch of tools, um, social features, routing features, um, features for basically defined um, training, so venues, studios, swimming pools, etc. Um, and a lot of them required a critical mass of users, which was why it wasn't a good idea to start with them. So we decided to build a routing tool because everyone can use a tool for routing without anyone else on the app or on the platform. And we, what was possible was you could enter your kind of sports, the distance you want to go, the, the, the climbing meters that you wanted to include, and the, um, I think the surface type as well. And then we built an algorithm that found you a few routes and you could choose one. That was the first thing. The second thing was you could uh, draw routes. Now Strava has that as well um, and a few others, but at the time no one had it. So it was pretty cool. Uh, you could basically draw whatever you wanted to draw and, and then we would find a route for you. People who wanted to use that uh, would sign up with Strava, so with their Strava accounts, and by that giving us access to their training history, which they knew, so it was not something they didn't know. But um, that way we pretty quickly built a huge data set of, of training data. Uh, literal training data and AI training data. And um, the problem with that was that we figured after a few months, people had no idea that we or the name and Duco wants to be connected to training, but it is connected to roots, of course. So people kept asking us, why are you different than Komoot? And I was like, what? How do they, why? And then, of course, yeah, well, we, we we launched a routing app, so of course they are comparing us to other routing apps. So it took quite a while and some money to get rid of the, the routing image and, and shift it towards training. And since then, I mean, it's a huge step now, but since then we have a, I would say, healthy mix of paid social media apps, uh, ads. Um, podcast is something that works really well for us and YouTube videos as well. Um, and just recently, but also that's a very huge step now, uh, time-wise, um, in terms of product, using the product as marketing tool, um, we have made good progress. So uh, we'll see how that is going in the future. A lot of listener, listeners uh, that want to start with their product or listening to founder stories because they want to get inspired. But like, what was your strategy at the beginning? Did you? You know, build the product, launch it, and then try it, test it, or was it sales first, or some users? But uh, you mentioned the routing, but that was a. I mean, what happened before? Did you have the whole product already, or did you? Oh no, you bootstrap the company. No, no, no. I already got around, but uh, was it the bootstrap company at first? Did you have a seed round? Tell us about the beginnings. When I had the idea about this, I didn't have a team and I didn't have any money, so I worked as a. I worked at another startup first, which was actually very helpful in terms of what not to do or how not to do things. What did they do? Uh, it was called Infit and the idea was, it was actually the, the rare um, case that they were looking for sports scientists, which is not happening very often uh, in the startup world. So the idea was that based on micro RNI profiles, now everyone knows what that is, mRNI, uh, based uh, because of, of COVID, but at the time it was no one knew it. Based on those profiles, that we could see how people react to certain kind of trainings, and then also look into the future and give them individualized training. That was what the that was the idea. But neither the product nor the team worked. So um, I left the, the team after I think nine months or so. Uh, but I needed a job, so I, I hired, uh, I, I asked the, the, the university, um, every university, or almost every university in Germany has an office to advise founders to be about things they should do or should not do. So I did that for, it's basically consulting. So I did that for 11 months, I think, almost a year. But I told my boss at the time, we will apply for Exist, which is a... Um, 
basically free money from the government to found a company in Germany. Uh, and as soon as we get that, I will resign and, and do that. And that is what happened. So we, we applied. Um, it took me over a year to find two guys in IT to, to start to work with. At the time, no one knew what sports tech is or fit tech. I always had to explain to people it's what it is. Now everyone knows, but at the time, no one knew. So finding people in IT was really hard. And that's how we started. So we started working on simple products, um, started to see first results of how it could work and could not work, um, but then figured, yes, we need training data um, to, to make it work better. And that's, that's where, we, um, where I just picked up on earlier. Okay, and with the with the uh, user base or the current user base, what was the do you did you saw any like peaks in in the growth and why? So like, what did you do in order to make those peaks back in the days where you didn't have budgets for marketing and they didn't have at least that budget budgets? I mean, after round budgets, you know what I mean? There were different approaches. So we'll probably get to financing, but the after about half of so you have one year during this exist period um and after about six months we started to think about fundraising and um, managed to then after about a year so just before the end of the exist year to close a pre-seed round with the local family office um so then there was money to advertise but before that um we didn't really have some. So we tried to use communities, might be Strava. We did stuff on Twitter. We, we tried to do anything that would then become viral, which never happened, but we, that, that was the idea, uh, in the beginning. And then we thought about partnerships the first time. And actually at the time <laughs> they were in the media just recently. That's, that's why it's sort of funny, but they, Someone reached out to us from a huge e-com brand um, in cycling and outdoor sports. I think actually the biggest in Europe, at least until recently. Um, and he saw an ad that we posted on um, Instagram for testing purposes. So we just wanted to see how people react to what we post. And so he saw that and got in touch. And then we had a call and he really liked what we did and put us in touch with their CEO. They actually traveled, so it's a, it's an 800 people company. They, th and this guy actually travels to Saarbrücken where we were and still are based, which is a very small city. Um, I always describe it as, as we're actually closer to Paris than to everything else in Germany. Well, they visited and we had a brief exchange. Briefly, we had a long exchange, how we could integrate what we do to their branding strategy, etc. cetera. Um, and from the theory sounded great. But in, uh, in practical terms, it was a disaster because things took way too long. It wasn't anyone's specific fault, but it just, that was one of the first learnings that waiting for huge partners to make things happen is mostly not worth it. The partnership didn't work at the end, but um, yeah, partnerships were, and now actually they, they become more relevant again. But, um, in the beginning, we thought this is, is a good idea, but then also now looking back, reflecting on that, you can't really expect to knock on someone's door and tell them how great you are and how great it is what you're doing and expect them to say, oh, yeah, of course, let's team up that we're going to do that. They don't know you. They don't know the product. Uh, they don't know how people react to it. They don't know if you have a branding strategy, how those two brands work together, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, looking back as always, things look a bit more clear. You mentioned some communities as well, that you tried to engage some communities at the beginning. And then you mentioned that they were important later for considering networks. And I've checked that you're a member of, for example, FitTech mm -hmm. Club and, and other networks. Are those the, the partnerships you mentioned? I mean, are they important in the journey or these are rather some of your personal networks that you're a member of, not necessarily a company? Both. I think in general, networking as a founder is one of the most important things you can and should do, especially if you're based in an area that is not known to be the hub of everything. 
So Fit Tech Club is actually funny because uh, Natalia, she, I think she kept emailing me for over a year. And I always said, no, I'm not going to pay for ad access to a network. Um, so far, every time I wanted to get in touch with someone, I managed to somehow. So I'm not going to pay for that. But then at a certain point, I don't actually remember why, but I said, okay, let's try this for one year and then we'll see how it goes. And based on this, I have met a few people who then became partners later. So uh, just recently we did a small uh, cooperation with Super Sapiens and I got in touch with Phil, I think through the club. And then we met in person over a year later, last year in, in Vegas at the CES. And then it took another few months for us to somehow make a partnership work. That's what I meant by it takes time, but building trust yeah, it, takes time. It's a club for fit tech and sport tech founders, right? Exactly. Yes, correct. With the um, Enduco branding strategy and the journey, I've checked the app, of course, but what are the, because, you know, we, we, we had a few sport tech founders, by the way, in, in, in the podcast. And what interests me the most are the views on the, future of, of, of the technology, especially in sport. And mm. what are your plans? I mean, for the future, any, any, any upcoming features or expansions that will be in the pipeline, but will be uh, targeting something particular that you obviously can share. I know that not, not, a, not a lot of those you probably can, but you said expansion, let, let's start with the markets. So I think, uh, well, we started in, in the Dach region, so Germany, Austria, Switzerland, because of the languages. We just recently translated the app to uh, Italian, French. Uh, we made a difference between UK and US, um, English. Um, and with French and English, you can also target Canada. So those are the, the markets we're currently in and targeting, or the, the markets we're in. You can download the app wherever you want, but may not be in your specific language. Um, I think the US obviously is very interesting. Um, more than 300 million people, uh, lots of them are somehow engaged in endurance sports. Still, I think a lot of startups make the mistake to use their marketing concept and throw it over the Atlantic and think it works, but I think it often doesn't. So it's definitely a different market. Then there is Brazil, which is a huge market in endurance sports. And of course, Asia and, and in some parts, even Africa, I think, become more and more interesting. Feature-wise, we started in a, in a very um, competitive target group. So the people we were, our early customers were all engaged in some sort of competitions. They, 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 they trained to measure themselves against themselves or others. This target group is very interesting because they are highly engaged in the product. They are willing to spend a lot of money on their sports, not just on, on apps and training, et cetera, but it's mostly on equipment, to be honest. But it was clear that we want to broaden that target group. So we thought about ways to do that. And what we recently did is two things. First, we uh, integrated an Apple Watch integration, which gives us access to a complete new target group. So the target group we started with, they would never wear an Apple Watch. It's not professional enough. So it gives you access to a different target group. And the second one is um, when you onboard to the app now, if you download it and then you will be asked, are you familiar with the terms FTP, VO2 max, et cetera, et cetera. If you click no, then you'll be, basically it's a shortcut directly into the app. Um, and we will calculate the values in the background. If you say yes, you are familiar with those, then we're gonna ask you for those. And by that we differ between two, to target groups. And then about a year ago, we internally, the whole team, we talked about realigning or reformulating what we are actually doing and why we're doing it. And our vision then became to be the most trusted partner in endurance sports, because it always comes down to trust. If you trust a personal trainer or any form of solution, in our case, an app, with your training and then you fail after training for a few months, of course, trust is gone. So the user is gone and he or she will most likely not tell people positively about you. So being aware of that and being respectful with people's time, etc., there's a lot of aspects when it comes to this trust part. When we're talking about trust to people, it's 
very important how do you gain trust between people you communicate you talk to each other you get a feeling of this person that's very hard to do if you have an app on the other side or some sort of technology so for us communicating is very important but it also needs to be scalable because otherwise the idea that we have making it accessible to everyone for a fair price wouldn't work so we could hire a lot of coaches and have them sit here and, and chat with people but that would be very expensive so we tried using um, a chat which we put into the app but it was hard coded so you could basically only choose between certain answers and then you would, would get always the same answer if you if you would go the same path but the the overall reaction to that was very positive so i thought okay a chat might be a good might be a good idea the next thing we tried to basically work around this communication is gamification. So we tried to have people more engaged by giving them fun ways to engage more with the training. Basically, we were rewarding how accurately you did your training. So if you get a training session suggested and you do it, then you get an accuracy uh, bar. You still get that and you still get points for it. But the gamification part, as soon as we launched that, people were relatively open about what they would want to have changed before we start some sort of gamification thing. So we we took that out of the app again. And then until very recently, there were there were options from other companies, which makes it way easier for us to work on on communication. So we will launch a, a closed beta with a new feature, which will then be able to communicate basically basically like a human but in the app mm -hmm. and by that we, we we hope to build more trust to users so that is that is the idea behind it since it's a dress sport that i mean special i mean targeted and i always thought that these athletes amateur athletes of course are the most willing to spend money in general because their trainings are usually the most expensive their equipment is usually the most expensive maybe not runners but you know triathlon bikers all of them just spend a lot of money on trainings and are there any other common let's say um traits of or, or, or how the, those users behave what they buy how they buy how they react or you mentioned trust you mentioned some things like that but are there any others most likely yes but i <laughs> um you know because my my point is that is it easier to convince them uh, it, because probably also these users are i mean these athletes are using a lot of in the recent years especially probably more tech than they used to five years ago oh. definitely right you know so are there and so probably they're more tech savvy in a sense they're, that i'm sure they yes. use, are already using something except for your app and so for example do you do you integrate with uh, all of the feature all of the possible you have all the possible integrations with uh, different apps for for example cyclists or yeah. triathlon, et etc how does it work in your case yeah yeah they 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 qualify as tech savvy that I, that i would say so we very early version of the app did tracking as well so you could track your training with the app but we got rid of that again because we we only do it with third third partners now so you can connect your garmin polar strava whatever you're using if the data of those providers is good enough for what we do then we have an integration with them or we are working on the integration a lot of okay. people are asking for whoop at this point because uh, they they have some things that others don't but uh, well, we've been in touch with Whoop, and Whoop, the, the quality of the data is just not good enough. So that's why we don't have integrated them. But in general, we do have integrated, I think, all the major uh, third-party companies. And how it works is people train with those devices, upload the training to the Interco platform. We do what we do, and then you can also export the suggested training to to the device of your preference and and train with that again. Also, I wanted to come back to the thing you mentioned about the multiple languages uh, at Enduco. I mean, of course, there are probably some challenges of having a multilingual platform, and I'm sure you want to expand. Uh, so that's that's something important. But uh, where was that? I mean, except for that, how long did it 
take you to think about the expansion? I mean, was it that the first thing you did and then you invested in marketing? What was your strategy there? If you can share some insights, because as I as mentioned, probably you're in the, I mean, you're in a nice spot where you're thinking about different markets than only DAG, right? I thought about that way too early, looking back. But in general, I mean, if you have an app, the beauty of it is you in the app stores, it's, it's a few clicks and then it's available wherever. But um, th there are a few reasons. I mean, at the end, it's always a little bit more work than you than you would expect. So we worked with an agency trans to translate the app in the languages. Then you need to think about uh, language specific support, um, which we don't have. We all the support we do and we managed to keep the support team relatively small by using a lot of technology things, but we only do this in English and German, which is enough for now. But I'm sure that especially there are some countries where English proficiency is not that high, namely France and Italy, for instance, in Europe. And then I think you might need to, to think about country specific support. Besides Apple and Google charging the fees they do, it's pretty easy to expand to different markets. Markets. Europe is where we are from, um, but of course there are a lot of different languages that you need to keep in mind. So the US often, I know some founders who they started in Germany and then they just went straight to the US with the whole team sometimes uh, because they all speak the same language more or less. So I think you just need to think this a bit more through than it's just, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a tick on Italy and France and, and all the others, and then it'll work. Um, you always, if your product doesn't grow on itself, you need to have the budget to make marketing in all those markets. Otherwise you just don't have to launch. Did you, cause I had a lot of founders that had the strategy that they just hired local managers in the countries they wanted to to scale in, but sometimes these strategies failed. Some hired expansion managers or head of growth, but in their, let's say, premises in their in their countries that they're from, what, what, what's your strategy? I know B2C market is different than B2B, and I know these are different strategies, but what's your, what, what are your plans? Or maybe, what were the mistakes that you, that you made? I'm sure there were a few. Uh, actually, I just last year, uh, last week, I was talking to a B2B founder and he, uh, it was a, actually, it was a free day for the both of us. And he was in calls constantly with customers. And I was, what are you doing? Why are you this? And he said, you know, I think the difference is you don't have to talk to everyone in B2C. You communicate through marketing mainly, and he has to do the calls and call them. How did you execute the strategy? I know you thought, okay, we're going international, but how did you execute the strategy? Did you hire some uh, p people particular from the exp like, no, expansion growth or what, was it a different strategy? Like, what did you do? Now, team-wise um, or hiring-wise, I have become more conservative. So before I hire someone, I think about a lot, do we really need this position and what will be the return of investor of that position? if there is one. If there is none, then there will be no hire. So we did this completely internally. I was in the US a few times before we considered going there. And I thought about hiring someone based in the US. If we start doing proper marketing there, that still might be an option. I'm actually not sure if we, how we do it. If, if we have a team overseas, probably does make sense given what I said earlier about using the same marketing concept, concept is here and then trying it there. So far, we have done everything ourselves. Um, basically, my, my colleague, Leonard, he, he managed the translation part and then also the marketing part of, of the, for the countries. So, so far, we've done it ourselves. But in the future, I think it's a good idea to hire someone, especially if it's far away. I think for Europe, you don't need, you can do it yourself. But in, in the US and, and markets that are further away, it might be a good idea. And in, in pretty recently you've raised uh, some funds and with the B2C market, does it end in a sense, like how soon will you have to <laughs> have to raise another round to be able to grow with the pace that you obviously plan, but in the B2C, I know B2C is different as mentioned before, but probably, I mean, the need for the money is just huge to just attract more and more users, but what's your, what's your, what's the funding strategy? So. 
recently is is uh, is uh, a year ago, so it's uh, it's been a while since we raised the seed. Um, but if you want to grow with only marketing, even if you have the budget, at some sort you will hit a point where there is like an, an ad fatigue. You need to always improve ads to have the same benefit that you might have had in the beginning or maybe in the middle part. The beginning is always a bit tricky, but we wanted to do that more and more capital efficient. So we've managed to lower our customer acquisition costs by a lot. Uh, I think almost 70% from the beginning until we decided to use the product more to grow. So we had an invite friends feature where you could simply invite your friends, but no one would get anything for it besides the code. And we decided that we need to do some things different here. So we launched, it's basically a lottery pot. So if I invite you, you get a three month subscription for 50% off. You won't find that subscription in the store. It's only accessible through that link. Once you click on the link, I have an, a pending ticket in my lottery pot. And once your two week free trial is over and you've converted to a paying user, then I have an active ticket. And at the end of every month, we draw one winner of all the active tickets. And the prize pot is relatively high. So in the first month uh, in October, it was 200 euros. And in, in November now it's 400 euros. This is not a bad deal for referring uh, an app, uh, basically. So that worked pretty well. And what we saw is that customer acquisition through that tool, again, is only one fifth of what it is through paid marketing. So we're now thinking about how we can lean more on this tool. We can't always, I mean, we can't push the prize money until a few thousand euros, but to how we can leverage that more compared to, to paid marketing. Okay, so the idea is to just scale faster, but with organic or maybe let's say growth hacking rather than just paid marketing and acquiring yeah. users. And but competing. still there will, I mean, there will be another financing round or some sort of anything that allows us to leverage a huge user group. And that most likely is cash. And with the, with the trends, we, we covered some of that, but this is what I always ask to the, to the founder from the, let's say endurance world, because I used to train some uh, endurance sports in a sense, but what, what, how do you foresee the future instead from the sen from the trends perspective, what are the main, let's say the, the emerging trends that you foresee shaping the, the future of, of the um, endurance world? And did you prepare anything to adapt to these changes? I think the discussion about data being shared is one that has only been relevant in politics. Um, I think users from users perspective, most people don't mind sharing their data as long as they know it's protected and as long as they get a value out of this. So if I give you more data, I want to have more for me. So more personalization. I think on the variable side, there will be new products, um, which what I think is interesting. I, I don't know if it's a trend, but what I think is interesting and what I think is going to happen is that we have variables um, under our skin. So that is something I, yeah, I can see that happen. And I think the acceptance of that is getting bigger. In general, the, the market we are in, I would say, so the general sports tech market, I think is a very segmented market at the moment. So if you see uh, glucose monitoring, for instance, there is more and more companies offering, I don't want to be judgmental, but basically the same. And now Apple is also reportedly stepping into this, uh, which for some of them uh, might become tricky. And it's the same with other solutions. So we've seen that on a, on a huge scale already, on a larger scale. So I think there will be a lot of consolidation or partnerships. And frankly, some of the companies might not survive this. Um, and right. The, the order of we will the order of how we will see that is I think based on market size and potential impact of such partnerships and consolidations so and, and with now, the data protection because you said that uh, uh, in data security your app is also dealing with a lot of personal fitness data right so how do you yeah. prioritize that and how do you ensure? The privacy and security of user information since some of them might be just uh 
um, uh, concerning, I mean, connected with health, right? Yeah. So again, trust. If we fuck it up with someone's personal data, we are we do have trouble, and not just from the user's perspective, but also from a legal perspective. I mean, we are in in Germany, uh, in the heart of Europe. The GDPR is relatively straightforward with how to deal with personal data. Um, so that we have to comply. Of course, we do comply by that. I don't want to uh, talk this down. So I think it's relevant to people what they share and who they share it with. But I don't think that the general skepticism is that high as it sometimes is is uh, is described on a, on a political agenda. But of course, you I mean, it's, it's completely obvious that you have to take care of the data you're dealing with. This is something that we always uh, or uh, that we ask pretty frequently, especially to the founders. But I wanted to get some advices, but not the general ones, but like more targeted in the, let's say, sport, sport tech, fit tech space. If you were, of course, if probably if you were to found a company again, you would do a lot of things differently for the aspiring entrepreneurs that are in a completely like an idea stage. Yeah, I think I have some general ones, but they might it might be a mix. So yes, 100%, I would do things a lot different now. In the beginning, you you think, well, I don't want to generalize here, but I thought I, I knew how things work. I knew how I want to do it. Um, I need to know, I, I know what I need to do to do it, etc. cetera. Um, looking back, I knew nothing that I think is important to know, but also that should not keep you from doing things. You need to try things in order to see if it's if it works or if it doesn't work. Just because I might tell people I did it that way, it doesn't mean that it works for them. So this is one, this is a more general one, but just because it worked for someone else, it doesn't have to work for you. And that should not keep you from trying, except the obviously stupid ideas, but you need to find your way and you need to find, and I didn't have that and sometimes still don't have, you need to have the confidence to do it your way, even if it fails, it doesn't matter. Um, at some point I st stopped, that would be the second advice, read a lot, a lot of books and articles. At some points I stopped reading biographies, at least for the purpose of seeing how person X, Y, and Z did it, because it doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter for me. Um, it's great that it worked for them, but it will most likely not work for us, for me, because it, everything's different. My background is different. My topic is different. My environment is different. Everything's different. So finding your way, and uh, <laughs> this, is, this is something I discussed with a lot of founders, finding your way is actually the hardest part of it in everything, in, in leadership, in self-care, in the way to do things, to think about things, not being the person that everyone or most people in the startup bubble ecosystem expects you to be is one of the hardest things um, there is. This is this is a this is a this is a big one. But if you have any further questions to that, I'm I'm happy to go more into oh, detail. Good point. Good point. Good point. With biographies, interesting point. This uh, actually is a this actually is a, is a problem because if you talk to investors, especially in the beginning. Besides the fact that would be one learning for everyone who's interested in it. I send out, I don't know how many hundred emails to potential investors, but looking back now, my long list, I think con consists of 30 contacts, but I know those contacts. I've built a relationship with them again, trust. I've sent them updates over so many months. And I now know that if I just send out a cold email to some VC in Berlin, they won't care. I re I once met uh, last year, actually at Slush, I met a guy from, from a VC in Berlin and the round table we were talking and I said to him, yeah, well, maybe you've heard of it before I emailed you once and he says, no idea. And then we were talking about this, that VCs don't reply to founders very often. And then he took out his phone and showed me his LinkedIn inbox from just today. And it was 130 messages. And then it became clear that how is he able, he isn't able to, to read this, of course. So now they, they need to be very um, strict with what they're replying to and whatnot. And 
the best way to get to them is through an intro. And how do you get an intro? Well, you need to target the right people, gain trust, and then they might help you. On the other side, and that's the tricky part with what I touched on earlier, they also expect you as a founder to be the typical stereotype founder guy. You need to hustle 24 seven, be available all the time, talk fast, think fast, know everything, be an athlete, etc. Even if you for yourself know you're not that kind of guy, it's very hard to convince them, oh, actually, well, he's not the kind of guy I was expecting, but he might still be, there might be something. And getting over this hurdle yeah. is, is very tough and still have the self-confidence to not think I'm, I, I'm, I can't do anything is very hard. You mentioned it's a family fund, right? It's a it's, it's not a VC that well, all... now it's now it's more. So the the seed round, the pre-seed round was was a family office, and then the seed round was a, a local uh, VC, business angels, and the family office. You kind of generalize it, but if you would to to choose between uh, the, like the smart money perspective, like angels, mm. VC, what was the uh, let's say. The, 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 I mean, the, the better hand in a sense. Yeah. So in the beginning, um, we were talking to business angels and I, we had a very bad start because I mean, I, we had a very bad start with business, with the idea of what a business angel is and does, because this guy with, as I know now, basically no experience, um, wanted 40% of the company for, I don't know what giving advice. And that was that was my first idea of what a business angel is. And I thought this is a, I'm not going to work with them now having a better network, um, and know the ecosystem, I would 100% go with business angels, even though the valuation topic, etc., may not be what I think it is, but in the beginning, it doesn't matter anyway. So getting the right people on board who then have a network that you can leverage is so much more important than, than money. So I would definitely do that different this time. But now I also know uh, what a business angel is. Um, and in the beginning, I obviously had a wrong image of that. But Andrew, thank you. Thank you very much for sharing uh, all of the, all of the stories and the points from your journey. They're very inspiring. And thank you for, for being here today. Of course. Thanks for having me. Stay in touch with us. Subscribe to our podcast. Give us a like, comment, or share. If you want to reach out personally, you can find me on LinkedIn and Instagram.